Hi everyone and welcome to today's lecture which focuses on the microbes known as bacteria and archaea. Okay, two different different types of microbes that you encounter. Now, uh, this is one of my favorite lessons because microbiology and lessons dealing with this stuff, they are just inherently cool. Okay, so I think you'll you'll find some of the, the stuff that you see in this lecture a little more interesting and relatable than you may in, in other lectures, especially being students that have now lived through a pandemic. So our pandemic was caused by a virus instead of bacteria or archaea, but the concepts of what can make things pathogenic and understanding why microbes and, and studying them is so important are things that you will be more familiar with now, especially when we talk about transmission of microbes. You're all experts on that and how to better protect yourself now that you come from a generation that has unfortunately had to live through a, a quite long pandemic. Now, as I just said, when we talk about bacteria and archaea, they are both microbes, which means that they are organisms that you cannot see with your naked eye. You're not going to be walking down the street and say, hey, look at that archaea or check out that bacteria. No, instead you would need a microscope to actually visualize these organisms and yet they are all around you, especially bacteria. You know, just inside your body, on the outside, in the air in front of you, covering that cell phone and laptop that you're playing with right now. They are everywhere. And if you take microbiology, you get to really get a bit traumatized almost <laughs> with the ubiquity of them. And ubiquity is just a term meaning present everywhere. Now, when we talk about bacteria and archaea, they are both microbes. Now, what is the main commonality between them, meaning, you know, what, what's common or the same between them? Well, they are both unicellular prokaryotes, okay? Circle star, highlight that fact because that tells you that they are both single cells, okay? They're not going to have a body made up of a whole bunch of cells. A bacteria will be just one cell. An archaea will just be one cell. And they are both prokaryotes, meaning they do not have a nucleus. And that's opposed to or different from, let's say, us, because we are eukaryotes. We have a nucleus in, in our cells, Okay. So make sure, you know, I could ask you which of the following has a nucleus, bacteria, archaea, or human cells. Or I could even say bacteria, archaea, or fungi. So fungi, yeast, and mold are eukaryotes. Remember that. Fungi or fungus, such as yeast and mold, are eukaryotes, whereas bacteria and archaea are prokaryotes. And so I know most of you already know that term, but I do just want to write it for you so they are not eukaryotes. Okay, so those guys are not eukaryotes. They are prokaryotes instead. Examples of eukaryotes, so eukaryotes would be humans or fungus. Okay, so again, fungus would be yeast or mold. Okay, so eukaryotes would have a nucleus. Okay, so any of those guys, humans, fungus, use their mold, they would have a nucleus. Now, when we say, well, okay, they're both prokaryotes, that's great, they're both single cellular, what's different about them? Well, the main difference is that archaea you find in extreme environments. So for instance, in the picture on the screen, that is a hot spring. Okay, so this here, that's hot springs 
crazy, crazy high temperatures, sometimes a lot of high pressure that you'll find in those kind of environments, you would find archaea living in those extreme environments. And because they are able to survive in extreme environments, archaea also tend to have different outer structures, so slightly different outer structures, meaning the, the composition of their plasma membrane and cell walls are different from bacteria. Okay, so different uh, plasma membrane. Sorry, my handwriting is sloppy today. And um, cell wall composition. Okay, so make sure you're familiar with what we mean when we talk about bacteria, what we mean by archaea, you know, how are they similar, how are they different, and make sure to star, you know, who, who would have a nucleus, who would not. So bacteria and archaea would not have a nucleus, and any of the eukaryotes that we mentioned, those would have a nucleus. Now, when we talk about bacteria and archaea, you have to ask yourself, well, what is it called when we professionally study them? What is the field that focuses on learning everything about bacteria, archaea, and all of the different microbes that can only be seen with the aid of a microscope, meaning you can't see them with your naked eye? And the name of that field is micro biology. And now you may ask yourself, well, why would we even want to study all of these microbes, things like bacteria, archaea, viruses, fungi? Like, why don't we just focus on humans, for instance, what we are? Well, it's very, very important to study microbes for a lot of different reasons. And again, as students who have lived now through a pandemic, you understand more than even my previous students why it's so un, you know, important to understand these microbes, to study everything we can about them. So the first reason why you would want to study microbes like bacteria and ar archaea is for the medical reasons. So for instance, by understanding the structure and the way that bacteria work or microbes work, we're able to better understand how they make people sick and how we can then target, treat them, and hopefully kill them and prevent you know, so many patients from getting sicker or encountering these various microbes. It also helps us related to medical in the industry field, meaning the field responsible for making a lot of the different enzymes and drugs and pharmaceuticals that we use in everyday life. So for instance, a lot of the drugs and antibiotics that we treat people with or a lot of the enzymes that we use in research and in labs, these things actually originally came from bacteria or from microbes producing them. And we learned from studying these organisms how to then mimic them, how to synthesize similar things. They also help us when we study them because we can use what we learn for the food industry. Okay, so for instance, learning about processes in various organisms allowed us to better understand fermentation and to use these microbes to produce things like yogurts and cheeses, beer, alcohol products, you know, things like that. So microbes are very important in the food industry as well. And lastly, studying microbes is also important for what we call taxonomy. And taxonomy is when we study the various relationships and, and ancestral connections of various organisms. Now, that's important. You know, you may wonder, well, why does it matter if we know which bacteria is related to which other bacteria? Well, it's very important, especially again, in if you're thinking in the medical sense. 
If you know that a certain bacteria is closely related to another one, then it's likely that treatments that work for one may be able to target the other as well. Okay, so learning about taxonomy and how different organisms are related to each other can really help us in a lot of different fields. Okay, and there are many other reasons as well, but these are the main reasons why it's so important to study things like bacteria. Now, one of the things we study when it comes to microbes are their morphologies. And morphology simply means the form that you see of something. You know, what shape is it? What size is it? What does it look like? So the first aspect of morphology that I want you to know when we talk about bacteria are the main shapes that you would encounter and what we refer to them. So the main shapes that you hear for bacteria are coccus, sorry, that's a C, bacillus, and spiral. And the spiral you sometimes hear as spirillium or spirochetes, which are the terms down here that I just um, put, a, put a rectangle around. So if you see the term coccus, that tells you that that bacteria is round shape. Okay, so for instance, these here, that would be coccus shaped. If you see bacillus, that is rod shaped. So the long orange bacteria that you see here, those are rod shaped, they're bacillus. And the trick to remembering that, the difference between coccus shaped and bacillus, is I like to circle or color in the O of coccus to remind me that that's the round bacteria. And then I turn the L's of bacillus into rod-shaped bacteria to remind me when you see that a bacteria has bacillus in the name, it will be rod-shaped, okay? Circle star highlight the terms so that you know them. In addition, when we talk about morphology, we also like to talk about how those individual bacterial cells arrange themselves when there's multiple together, okay? And so arrangements you see in this square here, the two that I really want you to know is streptococcus and staphylococcus arrangements of bacterial cells. And there's a trick to remember, you know, the fact that if you look at streptococcus arrangement, notice that the bacteria are lined up in a chain. They're in a long chain-like arrangement, whereas staphylococcus is clumped together like a clump of grapes. And it's actually because staphylo in Greek uh, was originally a term used for grapes. And so Staphylococcus looks like a cluster of grapes. Now, when we talk about arrangement, the trick to remember is strip of strep. Okay, so Streptococcus is a linear arrangement, whereas Staphylococcus I think of a cluster of staff, thinking like the staff at a hospital, the nurses clustered together, okay? So staff is cluster shaped, whereas strep is a linear arrangement, okay? The last thing for morphology that we're gonna talk about is motility. And so for motility, the three main forms that I want you to know is that some bacteria use flagella or a flagellum, depending on whether it's singular or plural. So flagella is an individual one and flagellum is multiple. So sorry, my screen messed that, that up a little bit. That's F-L-A-G-E-L-L-A, -L -L -A, flagella. The second form of motility, and I'll talk about them in a minute, is called axial fil filaments. 
Okay, axial filaments, sorry, that should be 1L. Um, axial filaments, let me just make that 1, 1L. And then the last one is called gliding motility. Okay, so flagella or flagellum, which you see, is what you see in this first, uh, first of the swimming pictures here. So those yellow lines following behind the bacteria, those are flagella, and basically the bacteria will whip them around like a boat propeller and push themselves forward. Axial filaments are directly under the outer surface of the, the bacteria. They're actually a lot of times called pseudo-flagella, you know, fake flagella, and they allow the bacteria to corkscrew into things. So for instance, spirochetes, or the spirals that you see in the, the center picture here, those use axial filaments. So does the bacteria that causes syphilis they use axial filaments and they allow the organism to corkscrew into tissues and surfaces as part of their movement. And it helps them to better attach, which actually makes them much more problematic for you if you get infected by them. The last form of motility is gliding, which you see in the, the last picture here, but you can't really see it in the picture because it's, uh, the, it's a type of movement. Gliding is basically if you wet, if you, if you put like water on, on a slide and then slide right down in it, slipping, slipping right down it, or if you have a sheet of ice somewhere and you slide across that, that's what the bacteria basically do. They secrete some proteins and kind of like a slime trail, almost like you see with slugs, and they slide across that for movement. Okay, so please make sure that you are comfortable with all the terminology here. I can describe something and you should be able to identify what I'm talking about. So for instance, if I talk about propeller-like uh, movement, that would be flagella. If I mention the word corkscrew, so if a bacteria corkscrews into tissues, that would be using axial filaments. Uh, motility, that term simply means the ability to move on one's own. So a bacteria can move by itself, it has motility. Uh, I could describe a bacteria and say that it is rod shaped, and you should know that that's bacillus, or I could ask you, what does the term bacillus tell you about a bacteria? Okay, and you would say it tells you it is rod-shaped. It tells you nothing else about that bacteria. It just tells you it's rod-shaped. It doesn't tell you about the arrangement or it doesn't tell you about the movement. Uh, for arrangement, I can say if you see bacteria in a linear arrangement, what would you refer to this arrangement as? And it is a streptococcus arrangement. If it's clustered, it's staphylococcus. Okay, so make sure you're comfortable with all the terminology. Now, when we talk about the morphology, you know, shape, size, and what these little, little microbes look like, it's then important to think about their actual structure. And the most important structure that I want you to know when we talk about microbes, specifically bacteria, are their cell walls. And the cell wall of a bacteria is very important because by understanding and studying the cell wall structure and you know which, which organisms have it, which don't, what it's made up of, that tells us a lot about the aspects of that microbe that make it harmful to us. And it also tells a lot about how we can treat an infection from any of the pathogenic forms of that particular microbe. Okay, so it helps us develop drugs or antibiotics to, to treat and target the, the structure and to ultimately destroy that pathogen. Now, when we talk about the cell wall, each organism might have a slightly different type of cell wall. So the cell walls that you may have heard of before are plant cell walls, which contain a lot of cellulose, a type of uh, rigid carbohydrate, 
And whenever we talk about cellulose and microbiology, we talk about the fact that if you did not have your lovely little microbes in your gut, you know, microbes like E. coli and what you hear as your probiotic normal flora bacteria, you would not be able to digest plants, you know, various vegetables that you eat because that carbohydrate cellulose humans are not properly equipped to break down. So our bacteria in our gut actually help us to break that down. Now, what I want you to focus on in this lecture, since we're not focusing on, on, on plants, I want you to know the difference between the bacterial cell wall and plant cell walls. So you're used to hearing cellulose in cell wall structures because you've probably studied plants in other courses. Bacteria instead, their main carbohydrate component of their cell wall is peptidoglycan. And I want you to circle star, highlight this word. Peptidoglycan is the carbohydrate that is a main component of the cell walls of bacteria. And that is very important to know because that, that carbohydrate is how we stain various uh, bacteria and, and distinguish between different types of infections. And it's also how we kill a lot of bacteria is we use drugs or antibiotics that target the bacteria's ability to make peptidoglycan and to make their cell walls. Okay, so that'll be very critical when you take courses like microbiology. Now, I want to point out, since this chapter is called bacteria and archaea, instead of having peptidoglycan, archaea have what's called pseudopeptidoglycan. Okay, the difference between the two is the figures that you see down here. I want you to star both of the figures and point out that they are part of peptidoglycan. Okay, so peptidoglycan is carbohydrate and it's made up of a bunch of chains of these two sugars stuck together. Okay, it's made up of NAG NAM chains. You don't have to know the full words N acetylglucosamine, blah, blah, blah. I want you to know NAG NAM. Circle these two circle NAG and circle NAM. And right next to peptidoglycan, in parentheses, put NAG NAM. NAM chains, okay, because you you have chain as in chain like a necklace, okay, you have making up peptidoglycan NAG linked to NAM linked to NAG and you see it, it's these long chains of those sugars linked together, those carbohydrates linked together and that makes peptidoglycan. The difference between peptidoglycan and pseudopeptidoglycan Archaea in pseudopeptidoglycan, they have NAG linked together, but they do not have NAM. Okay? So if I ask, you know, if I say that a microbe has cellulose as the main component of its cell wall, what would it be? That would be a plant cell. Whereas if I say that a cell wall is mainly made up of peptidoglycan, well, which kind of cell would that be? It would be bacteria. And if I say pseudopeptidoglycan, or if I mention that the cell wall has NAG only and not NAM, that would be archaea, okay? So these are the ways that I could ask you questions about this. So make sure to pause, maybe rewind that part, write down the various ways that I could ask this, okay? If I say the cell wall has NAG and NAM, it's bacteria. If it's just NAG, it is archaea. And I know you're all thinking right now, well, NAG, that's just what the professor does all day with the Remind app, okay? But just remember the differences between these cell wall structures. So as I just mentioned, the most important structure to remember is the bacterial cell wall. Again, this is a structure that bacteria have, but we do not which is going to come up a lot in this course because that makes it an excellent target for when you're trying to treat a patient, okay? So when we talk about the bacterial cell wall, we categorize bacterial cells into two different categories based on their cell wall composition. So there are gram-positive cells and there are gram-negative cells.
Gram positive cells, you'll notice they have a thick layer of peptidoglycan. And what peptidoglycan is, if you remember from one of our previous lectures, that is a carbohydrate structure. Okay, it's carbohydrate with some peptides thrown in as a network. You'll see a picture of it in a slide or two. There's also their plasma membrane, which we also have. Okay, so notice all cells have a plasma membrane. And then for gram positives, there's tychoic acid sticking out. And we'll talk about that soon with regard to giving certain cells a, a bit of extra toxicity and also sometimes helping with attachment. Now, what you'll notice when you then look at gram negative cells is these two cell walls look very different from each other. Gram negative cells now have a very thin peptidoglycan layer. They then have an extra gap and an outer membrane. And their outer membrane has a lot of lipids and very selective porins. So what I want you to notice is when you look at these two cells, which one do you think is tougher to treat if someone has an infection? Well, which one would it be harder to get antibiotics into or drugs into? Gram negatives, right? So put a little star over here and write that gram negatives are not as sensitive to antibiotics and drugs because they have these extra layers and they have very selective porins, okay? Very selective porins. So gram negatives are more resistant, tougher to treat, whereas gram positives are more sensitive to antibiotics. The other difference that I want you to know is that gram positives tend to release what we call toxins, whereas gram negatives tend to release endotoxins. Okay, so we're going to talk about these in more detail at the end of this lecture, but for now know that positives are associated with exotoxins, whereas negatives are associated with endotoxins. Okay, and a little trick to help you remember the difference between the two is I always think to myself, gram positives are the ones with plenty of peptidoglycan. Okay, that P sound. So this slide is simply to review what I just went over on the previous slide. So first of all, the idea that bacterial cell walls have peptidoglycan, which is a network of sugars and of peptides. You'll see more pictures on the next slide, but this is just one small figure to show you the two sugars that are the main component of peptidoglycan. So they're NAG and NAM. There is a whole lot of this peptidoglycan in gram-positive cell walls. And remember, gram-positives, we said, are the more sensitive of the two types of cells. And they also tend to be associated with exotoxins. Whereas gram negatives, these guys are the ones with less peptidoglycan, but a whole lot of lipids. Okay, put little stars next to that because it's going to be important in later slides as, a, in an, as well as in lab that gram negatives have a whole lot of lipids. And then put a star next to the fact that gram negatives are more resistant, so they're going to be tougher to treat. And this is due to those selective pores we mentioned, as well as the extra layers that they have. And the last little point there is a reminder that gram negatives tend to be associated with endotoxin. Is the gram stain. And the gram stain allows us to distinguish cells based on their cell wall composition, meaning are they gram positive with plenty of peptidoglycan and very few lipids, or are they gram negative with all of those extra layers, thin peptidoglycan, and a whole lot of lipids. So to the gram stain, when you perform this differential experiment, 
you have four main reagents and I want you to know the purpose for each one and how any um, mistakes with them would then change your results. So first, you add a crystal violet primary stain. And when you hear primary stain, that means it's the first dye that you're adding to your cells. What happens here is all cells take in the primary stain, meaning both gram positive and gram negative will take in whatever the primary stain is that you use. If you use crystal violet, then all cells at this stage will be purple. So gram positive and gram negative after the primary stain of crystal violet are all purple. Keep in mind, you may not, some people may not use crystal violet. So whatever your primary stain color is, that's what all the cells become. You then add an iodine mordant, and what a mordant does is it complexes with the primary stain. And what that means is it's now making that stain much bulkier to help trap it within the cell. So it helps keep that color in the cell so that it's not easily leaking out. You then add 95% alcohol wash, which is a lipid solvent. I want you to put stars or circle or highlight that fact that the alcohol is a lipid solvent because where did you hear lipids? Which cells? The gram negatives. Only the gram negatives have a ton of lipids. And if it's a lipid solvent, that means alcohol will dissolve lipids, which means that it's starting to break down the gram negatives cell wall, okay? So if it's breaking down the gram negative cell wall, what happens? The primary stain color leaks out now, but only from the gram negatives. So at this step, what do your cells look like? Gram positive is still purple or whatever your primary stain color is, whereas gram negatives have lost their color. They are colorless, it leaked out. You then add the final reagent, which is the counter stain. In this example, it's safranin, which is a pink color. The counter stain can only enter any cell that's currently colorless, because think about it, if you try and put the counter stain in those gram positives, they're full of dye already. There's no room for a counter stain. So instead, the counter stain will only enter empty cells. Which cells are currently empty or, or without a stain right now? The gram negatives. So at the end of this stain, the gram positives still have the primary stain, whatever color that was, which in this example is purple. And the gram negatives now have the pink color, the safranin. Now you have to ask yourself, what are some things that can go wrong? And what would the cells look like if any of these errors happen? Okay, we are now at the Remind App question, so stop everything and make sure you send me your answers. Again, please send me a picture of the slide and then your answers so that I know exactly which questions you're answering. When it comes to gram stain questions, please make sure you're very comfortable with knowing each of the reagents or the steps, why you're doing them, <clears throat> and what happens after each one. And when we talk about questions about, you know, what happens if you accidentally do things out of order or for, forget something, the trick to doing those is write out each step what would happen. So, for instance, if the student forgot the alcohol step, well, that's later on, go through, well, what happens after they do the first step, the crystal violet? Then what happens after they do iodine? What happens when there's no alcohol and then when safranin is put in? So go step by step. 
Okay, and then contact me if you have any questions. Now, when it comes to bacteria and archaea and a lot of different microbes, there's a lot of metabolic diversity. And when you hear metabolic or metabolism, that means all of the chemical reactions going on in a cell or a body. And so the metabolic diversity that I want you to know about first is the various ways that bacteria and archaea can produce ATP, so the, the, the chemical reactions that do that. Also, how they obtain or produce carbon, which is very important building block in any cells, including your own. So this slide is mainly terminology I want you to know. So the first three terms here, phototrophs, chemoorganotrophs, and chemolithotrophs, I want you to circle star highlight the fact that any of these three terms refers to an organism producing ATP, producing energy. Whereas the two terms down here, autotrophs and heterotrophs, are for obtaining carbon. So be very careful about questions because you have to ask yourself, am I asking you about how that organism gets ATP and energy or am I asking about carbon, okay? Students mix those up a lot. Now with regard to producing ATP or getting energy, if an organism is a phototroph, it produces ATP by getting energy from light, okay? So phototrophs use light energy, such as from the sun, to produce ATP. Whereas chemoorganotrophs, if you underline or circle organo, that's because these organisms get energy by breaking down organic material, such as sugars, okay? So chemoorganotrophs break down organic material to produce ATP whereas chemolithotrophs will break down inorganic material to produce ATP, okay? So something like breaking down minerals to produce ATP. These two terms here, autotroph and heterotroph, now they're breaking something down, but not to get energy or ATP, they're breaking something down to get carbon as a building block to make various things in their cells. An autotroph, or self-feeder will break down inorganic things such as carbon dioxide to obtain carbon, whereas heterotrophs will break down organic matter such as sugar to obtain carbon. So you notice, for instance, I could ask you about something breaking down sugar and you have to pay attention, is it breaking down sugar to get ATP, which would make it a chemoorganotroph, or is it breaking down sugar to get carbon, which would make it a heterotroph? So please be very careful with questions referring to this terminology. Now, in addition to the wide variety you have with regard to, you know, how bacteria get their energy, their carbon, there's also a wide diversity with bacteria with regard to their genes, okay? The sequences of genes, the kinds of proteins they can ultimately produce, uh, all that fun stuff. Now, the three terms on this slide, I want you to circle star highlight transformation, transduction, and conjugation, because you will see these in almost every biology class you take. And no matter which part of science you go into, we all use it, whether you're in the medical field, the environmental, in the research labs, wherever you are in science, these are three big uh, experimental methods. And they also happen naturally out in nature amongst bacteria and various other cells. Now, the reason why these three terms are so important is they represent the three main ways that bacteria can obtain new genes, okay? New DNA, meaning that those bacteria can obtain new abilities because that's what your DNA and your genes do. They give you your abilities and what you look like. So, we call that gene transfer. So bacteria getting new genes is gene transfer. Uh, 
And the first one here, transformation, what that means is that the bacteria, which you see in this picture, the bacteria gets naked DNA from the environment. And what I mean by naked DNA is you notice this ring of DNA is not inside of any other cell or organism. It's just floating around the environment and the bacteria picks it up. Okay, so that's transformation. When the DNA that it's taking in is not in any other cell, it's just floating in the environment. You'll do that in a lot of the biology labs that you take at CSI as well or any school that you go to. Now transduction, the next one, instead of that DNA floating around by itself, it's in a virus and the virus injects, as you can see in this picture, the virus injects the DNA like a syringe into the bacteria. So now the bacteria has new DNA that it got that was injected from a virus. Okay, so the key here, transduction, is from a virus. The last one is conjugation, and a lot of my students think of conjugal visits to remember that, okay? If you don't know what that is, I'm not gonna explain it to you. Be careful when you try to, Google it. But anyway, the reason why they use that term to remember conjugation is because conjugation is basically bacteria sex. Okay, because in this case, gene transfer is coming from another bacteria. Okay, so that donor bacteria has the, the genes that the recipient does not currently have. You then see a conjugation bridge or pillus form between them and the transfer of that DNA from the donor to the recipient bacteria occurs. Okay, and it has to be direct cell to cell contact in this case. That's why it's like bacteria sex. Okay, so make sure you know the difference amongst these terms. So if I say that a bacteria picked up new genes, new DNA, or had gene transfer from naked DNA, it would be transformation. If I mention a virus, it is then transduction. And if I mention another bacteria, it's conjugation. Now, when we want to study microbes, especially in a lab setting, uh, some of the techniques that we use to grow and culture and study them are either enrichment or isolation techniques. Now, the difference between them is, as you see this first one, enrichment techniques, which are shown in these top two figures here, which are Winogradsky column figures. Okay, make sure you know Winogradsky columns are an example of enrichment, enrichment techniques. What this means is, is you are basically putting, you know, let's say dirt, soil, um, different, different uh, nutrients and whatnot into a tube. Sometimes you see them as empty soda bottles when classrooms make Winogradsky columns. And whichever you know, technique of enrichment you're using, you're basically putting a whole bunch of conditions into a container that promote the growth of a robust collection of microbes, meaning enrichment, you want to grow as many different microbes as possible. You want a lot of them more than you would usually encounter. You want a nice big collection of growth, many different organisms. The alternative to that, which we use a lot in labs, is the isolation culturing technique, which you see in these bottom ones here, where isolation, you are trying to isolate or grow single pure organisms. And so for instance, the quadrant streak, I want you to remember as an example of isolation, is this picture here, where you dilute a single organism sample until you get these individual dots, these little colonies that you can pick up and grab with, with a loop and then study that individual single organism that you isolated. This is the same idea in this picture here, except they are trapped in special media because they're anaerobic, so they don't like oxygen. Uh, so they're trapped in there, but you can see the individual little dots, okay? So enrichment, you're growing a whole bunch of different microbes to study. Isolation, you want a single organism. And please make sure you remember the examples.
In addition to culturing microbes to study them, there's also three terms I want you to know here in terms of studying microbial populations. Now, you're going to go into the details of these in any of the upper level biology courses that you take, especially we, we go heavy into detail in genetics and, and molecular, as well as microbiology for these. But for right now, I just want you to know that these three techniques exist to study microbial populations, and they are metagenomics, metatranscriptomics, and metaproteomics. And I want you to know that, for instance, metagenomics, what that means is we collect a sample from an environment, so for instance, pond water, and you generate and sequence all of the genes that you find in that microbial population, okay? All of the genes in a particular organism and, and then the, the particular microbial population. Metatranscriptomics, instead, you are isolating and studying all of the RNA from the microbial population. And metaproteomics is now all of the proteins from that microbial population. Okay, so when you see genomics, know it's all of the genes. Transcriptomics is all of the RNA. And proteomics is all of the proteins. A lot of times when we talk about various bacteria, archaea, any kind of microbes, we tend to focus on things like their genetics and studying their growth and, and culturing, or we focus, especially with bacteria, on their pathogenic qualities and the various medical field applications of studying them. But I threw in this slide to also show you that there are a whole lot of different ways beyond the medical field that we actually use and study bacteria or microorganisms, and one of them is called bioremediation. <clears throat> For the definition of bioremediation, I want you to write that that's when we use microorganisms to clean up pollution. Okay, so using microorganisms to clean up pollution, and this can include cleaning up waterways or various soil samples, all kinds of environmental aspects. Now, the first part here, hydrocarbons and, and the ability of microbes to break down carbon dioxide, it's basically showing that the main way that we have bioremediation is we're taking advantage of or using the bacteria's natural metabolic abilities. So basically the fact that bacteria can digest stuff or break down stuff that you can't, that, that we can't as humans. So you can throw, you know, bacteria into the, the oil spill and have the bacteria help break that down, break down those, those substances and, you know, kind of clean it up for you. This bullet point here is showing that it's not just oil spills or hydrocarbons. It's a lot of various other xenobiotics. And so Circle Star, highlight this term. Xenobiotics are things that are man-made, so they are not naturally occurring substances. So the that definition of xenobiotics is not naturally occurring substances, so basically anything man-made. And so a lot of times the big ones you think of are pesticides and plastics. The idea of good versus bad microbes. So like I just mentioned, we all have normal flora. And I want you to circle this word on your slides because this is very important. It's going to keep coming back to you. Normal flora are all of the microbes on or in your body that are not associated with disease. Okay, Not associated with disease at that moment. Okay. These are the microbes, such as your gut normal flora that we were just talking about, that are constantly living on or in your body and can actually help you okay, by preventing other microbes from being able to live on your body. Now, the one downside about normal flora is that they can be what we call opportunistic pathogens. Okay, opportunistic pathogens, underline this word, 
Okay, this will keep coming back in this course. Opportunistic pathogens mean that even though normal flora are normally not bad guys, they are normally not pathogenic, under certain circumstances, they can become pathogens. Okay, I want you to think about what kind of circumstances might make these good guys that are living on your body, just chilling on your skin or in your gut, what might suddenly make them a problem for you and give you symptoms? Okay, well, there are two main times when that will happen, when normal flora become opportunistic pathogens. The first one is if you ever become immunocompromised, right? So you're in a weakened state and these guys are opportunistic. So what are they going to do? They're going to jump on that chance, right? They're going to take advantage of your weakened state and now they will be pathogenic and hurt you. The other time that normal flora become opportunistic pathogens is if they end up in the wrong place. So for instance, if those gut normal flora like E. coli that we were just mentioning a minute ago, if they suddenly end up somewhere other than your gut, for instance, your urinary tract, well, boom, now you have an infection. You get a urinary tract infection because these path sorry, these microbes are not supposed to be there normally, and so now they are considered pathogens. Okay, so whenever you see opportunistic pathogens, remember that normal flora can become opportunistic pathogens if you are one immunocompromised, two if they end up in the wrong place. So the way that I usually like to kind of give the analogy for students to, to remember this concept is, well, you may be the, the nicest, best, genuinely good student in the world, right? Normally not a thief or a cheater. But if let's say you were sitting in the professor's office, they happen to have the final exam sitting in your line of sight, and well, suddenly some other student came along, right? Emergency came up, the professor had to quickly leave the room and forgot that that final exam was right in front of you. You're not normally a cheater, right? But I'm pretty sure that if you were suddenly left alone for a few seconds with the final exam just right there in front of you, there's a good chance that your cell phone's gonna come out and you're gonna snap a few quick pictures, right? Even if you're the most honest person in the world. And it's understandable because it's opportunistic, right? The opportunity came up and the temptation arose, okay? And that's what happens to the normal flora as well. Now, once normal flora or any microbe causes disease, that's when we call it a pathogen, okay? And there are certain terms associated with this idea of microbes causing disease. The first one is pathogenicity, okay? pathogen being a harmful microbe, right? Pathogenicity then means the potential or the ability for a microbe to now cause disease, to be harmful, okay? So pathogenicity, what I would do if I were you, I'd underline that P, that first P letter in pathogenicity, and then underline the word potential. So pathogenicity is the potential to cause disease. Whereas virulence is after that, virulence is the degree of pathogenicity. How severe of damage can that microbe cause? Okay, so pathogenicity is the potential to cause disease, whereas virulence is how severe of a disease will be caused, okay? Now, the biggest culprits of diseases in humans tend to be nosocomial infections. Anyone who's already kind of experienced any clinical work probably have heard this term. Nosocomial infection simply means any infection picked up in healthcare facilities, such as in the hospital. Now, unfortunately, one of the themes that we're gonna keep seeing in microbiology is that over 250,000 Americans a year die from sepsis, okay? Meaning 
that over 250,000 Americans each year die because they picked up an infection in the hospital. And sometimes that's going to be from those of you who are working in the medical field. Okay, so throughout this course, really think about how the stuff that we learn can help protect you, help protect future patients if you're going into the medical field, or even just help protect your loved ones if you're not going to the medical field. Because everyone knows that at some point or another, you or your loved ones will have to walk into a hospital or a clinic or a doctor's office. Okay, so keep these things in mind that we go through throughout the course. Now, if one of these microbes does become a bad guy, become pathogenous, uh, sorry, pathogenic, it must be able to do five steps. Okay, when we think of pathogenic microbes, in order to be a pathogen or a dangerous bad guy, a microbe must be able to do these five things. The first thing they have to be able to do is enter your body or your cells, okay? And think about it. What are some ways that they might enter your body? Well, breathing, right? You have to breathe all day. So any of those openings you're using to breathe, that's easy access. What else do you do all day? Eat and drink, right? Eating or drinking are easy access. Any cut that you get or opened wound, those are easy access, okay? Sexual contact, that's another common entry for pathogens. Okay, so throughout the course, we're gonna go through some, some of the various ways that microbes enter. But once they enter, in order to make you sick, they have to be able to stay in. If you instantly sneeze or you know cough them out, well, then they wouldn't be a problem, right? They have to be able to attach and adhere, stay in your body, okay? So now they've entered, they stay in. The next thing they have to do is defeat your defenses, okay? So highlighting here the word defenses. What does defenses mean in your body? That's your immune system, right? They need to be able to defeat your immune system, which is trying to destroy them. Once they've done that, they have to cause some sort of damage. Okay, because if they're not causing damage or not causing problems for you, then they're not a pathogen, right? You wouldn't even notice them. The last thing they have to do to be a true pathogen is transmit to a new host. Okay, because think about it. If this little bacteria only made one person ever in all of history sick, who never transmitted to any other host, well, then we wouldn't really know about it and we wouldn't really consider it a pathogen or a problem. Okay? So just remember, in order to be a pathogen, a microbe must enter, stay in, defeat your defenses, cause damage, and then transmit to a new host. Now, when we talk about bacteria or microbes being able to be pathogens to cause, you know, illness, <clears throat> one of the things we study is called etiology. And I want you to circle that term, etiology, and make sure you know that the definition of etiology is studying what the cause of an infectious disease is. And by cause, I mean the microbial causative agent. So exactly which bacteria or virus causes a particular infectious disease. Now, a big part of etiology is Koch's postulates. And so you don't have to memorize every little detail of Koch's postulates. I just want you to know what etiology is and the fact that Koch's postulates is used in etiology to help identify or confirm 
the exact microbe, you know, for instance, the exact bacteria that causes a particular infectious disease. And this figure shows you the steps of Koch's postulates. And they're kind of, you know, common sense in some way. It's basically saying that if there's an organism that has this particular infectious disease, you should be able to isolate the particular microorganism in that, that, that you think is causing that disease. And if you inject it into a healthy organism, that organism should then show the same symptoms or possibly die as the, the original infected organism. Then you should be able to isolate from that diseased animal the microbes, such as the bacteria, and it should look and be the same as the original one in the in the, the original diseased organism. So basically it's a way for us to track and say, yeah, this is what was in that sick organism that caused the illness because it causes the same illness when we put it in any other laboratory organism. But make sure you know the terms Koch's postulates, that it's used in etiology, and that both of these terms are associated with identifying exactly which microbe is causing an infectious disease. Now, when we talk about these various infectious diseases, there's some terminology that you'll come across. This is another one of those slides where I say, I'm sure at one point or, or another, you've all used these terms or heard these terms, but you may not have known the true distinguishing aspects of the terms, or even if you were using them properly. So, the first term is symptoms. And your symptoms are the changes in your body function that are felt by a patient as a result of disease, meaning, all of the things that you can visually see and feel due to having an infectious disease. Then we get to the next terms, and these terms are communicable, contagious, and non-communicable. Okay, all three describe infectious diseases, and you have to know the difference amongst them, as well as the examples of them. So first up, we have communicable diseases. Communicable diseases means that the disease can be spread from one host to another, but that it won't be that easily or quickly spread. So for instance, the way to better understand this is to think of the examples. So the examples I like to give for communicable diseases are food poisoning and STDs. As you know, these can be caught from other people, but you won't catch it just by standing next to someone who's sick with one of these types of infectious diseases, okay? So just by sitting next to someone who has an STD, you won't catch that STD. And as a New Yorker, I'm very grateful for that because traveling on public transportation, everyone would have an STD just by sitting and standing on those buses and subways. Now, when we then talk about contagious diseases, now it's a disease that's easily and rapidly spread from one host to another. So now with contagious diseases, just by sitting or standing in the same room as someone who has this infection, you can get it, okay? In fact, they might have been in that room a few minutes before you and left by the time you got there and you can get it. So for instance, just sitting in a seat in, you know, in a food court, Okay, maybe someone who had the flu was sitting there right before you sneezed all over that, that table, those chairs and all. It's all in the air, it's on the surfaces, and you can now catch it. Okay, so these are contagious diseases, things like the plague, like the flu, even like the common cold, where you can catch it very easily. And you notice with these, you know, if someone in your family catches the flu, odds are you're going to catch it too, just by being in the same house as them. Okay, that is contagious. The last one is non-communicable diseases. Okay, so this disease cannot be spread from one host to another. So these are diseases you cannot catch from another person. Instead, you're catching them from things like soil. Okay, 
So the example of non-communicable diseases is tetanus. Tetanus, you can't catch tetanus from another person. Instead, you catch it from spores in soil. Okay, so from inanimate objects. Now, just a reminder, as I say the word tetanus, anytime you hear tetanus, I want you to think tetanus and botulism are both two very problematic infections because of exotoxins. Okay, very dangerous infections because of the neurotoxins that they produce, which are exotoxins. Okay. Just in case I spoke too quickly during the last slide, this is a recap slide so that you have a chance to pause the recording and write down what I wrote or what I said for each of the um, definitions that you need to be able to distinguish. And again, make sure you're always comfortable knowing the examples as well as the terminology. Now, when you think of the spread of the disease from those reservoirs, there are various mechanisms that the infection can be transmitted. The first one is contact transmission. And when we talk about contact transmission, that means that you have either touch or close contact, okay? And contact transmission can be broken down into three different types of contact. There can be direct, indirect, or droplet contact transmission. So for direct contact transmission, that would be things like touching, kissing, biting, sex, any of those things, okay? Where you are directly contacting the sick individual, okay? Indirect, however, now you have a non-living intermediate, okay, to the sick individual. Now notice with indirect, okay, the non-living intermediate will be things that you associate with a sick individual. So for instance, needles, used tissues, hospital bedding, anything that you would have seen a sick person using, okay, that's indirect. Then you have droplet, and droplets would be if the sick individual sneezes, coughs, even laughs, and you get those little saliva airborne droplets. Now, when we talk about droplets, you should always ask yourself, what's more dangerous, smaller droplets or larger droplets? The answer is smaller droplets. They're more dangerous because if you think about it, if it's a small droplet, it could be airborne longer and further than a big, heavy droplet, okay? The next example of transmission is vehicle transmission. This is the one where pathogens now are hitching a ride on something you would think would be clean, okay? This would be something such as food or a fomite, like we talk about in lab. So in the case of vehicle transmission, the reason why it differs from indirect transmission, in vehicle transmission, the object is something that you don't associate with a sick person. Instead, it's an object, a fomite, that you would think is perfectly normal for anyone. Things like a doorknob, cell phone, glasses, your ring, your watch, okay, a shoe, any of these things that it's not like you see a sick person coughing and sneezing all over it the way you would with a tissue or a medical needle, okay? The last type of transmission is vector transmission and vector transmission can either be mechanical or biological. Either way, a vector is a carrier organism, usually an arthropod, or something such as a fly, a tick, a mosquito, any type of bug that you would think of, okay? When we then categorize it as mechanical or biological, there are two ways that this bug can get you sick. In mechanical, Mechanical is physical movement, right? So mechanical vector transmission would be like if you see a fly land on your food and suddenly its body parts are contaminating your food, okay? So it's brushing off with its little legs, looking like a little villain, rubbing its legs together, 
it might be brushing off pathogens onto your food that you then eat and get sick. So that would be mechanical when their body parts are contaminated and make you sick. Whereas biological, what's the other way an insect can make you sick? Well, by biting you. Their biological fluid. Okay, so mechanical is their body parts contaminating you, whereas biological transmission is biological fluid from a bite. So things like a flea bite causing the plague or a mosquito bite causing Zika, West Nile, malaria. Any of those would be biological vector transmission. So again, just to recap notes, because there was a lot of information there, I wrote down the key points, and you can once again pause the video in order to write down all of the notes. Now, just to help you visualize what we were talking about, we're going to go through each of the transmissions in picture form. This first form is contact transmission, where the first one you see is direct contact, where you kiss or bite or um, have sexual contact with the sick person. Then you have indirect contact transmission, which is inanimate objects that the sick person has touched and that you associate with sickness. And then you have droplet transmission, which are the bodily fluids that are um, exposed through sneezing, coughing, things like laughing. Vehicle transmission, we have the examples of water, food, air, and also you may want to remind yourself fomites, okay, F-O-M-I-T-E, which are the inanimate objects such as a cell phone or a doorknob handle. Then we have mechanical and biological vector transmission. Again, the fly on food, that would be mechanical whereas biting into your skin, that would be biological. So now, like I said, this lecture is a whole lot of terminology, okay? And again, they're terms that I'm sure you've encountered before, but maybe didn't know the true usage of them, okay? So here we have terminology relating to controlling the spread of disease. So the terms we have are isolation, quarantine, and vector control. When we talk about isolation, I always have students circle or underline that I, that first I of isolation. So when you hear isolation, think I or Roman numeral one, okay? Because in isolation, you are only separating the sick individual, just the sick person. Whereas in quarantine, you can circle or underline the first three letters, okay? Quarantine starts with qua, just like quantity, okay? Because a quarantine, you are now separating a quantity of people. You are separating all of the healthy individuals who had contact with the sick person and may now be infected but in the incubation stage and not showing symptoms. Okay, so the example would be if you picture a classroom. If student A is sick and has an infection and we isolate or separate student A from the rest of the class, that would be isolation. What we would then do is take all of the other students in the class and separate them from the public just in case any of them have caught this infection because you don't want them running around, you know, going on the bus, going on the subway, going into stores or the gym or other classrooms and now spreading this infection, which honestly, the concept of quarantine is very difficult to do. It's very difficult to control because again, so many people don't realize when they are carrying around an infection before they start to show symptoms. Okay, which we'll get to in the next page or the next slide. The last one here is vector control. What vector control is, is that you destroy the habitats or food or other resources that vectors rely on. And what we mean by vector are bugs, things like arthropods, things like mosquitoes, 
So the example of vector control that'll help you remember what we mean by this is the use of screens or netting. So think of mosquito netting and screens or even all of the mosquito spraying that you saw uh, a few years ago to reduce the risk of things like West Nile or Zika. So now once again, I've wrote a slide of some recap notes just in case you missed any of the information that I was saying on the last slide. So again, feel free to pause the video right now just so that you make sure to write down everything here on this slide. Is how pathogens will try to damage the host. Okay, damaging the host. Now, with damaging the host, there are two big causes. The damage can either be because of the pathogen itself being present and active, or the damage to your body can actually be because of your own body, because your immune system is trying to fight those bacterial cells or those viruses and accidentally, you know, friendly fire, injure your own cells or damage your own cells and tissues. Okay, so if you think about things like excess inflammation, your immune system is trying to help you, but it can also be quite problematic if you have too much inflammation. So when we talk about damaging the host, there are two big categories to remember. There's direct damage or indirect damage when we're talking about damage being caused by the pathogen itself. Now, if it's direct damage, then you're basically going to think of it as the direct damage from the physical pathogen itself. So kind of picture if that pathogen is kind of crashing into cells and tissues. So the pathogen itself is destroying host cells or tissues. Okay. Indirect damage is now when you have a systemic, so body-wide trouble because of toxins produced by the pathogens. And in the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about the two big categories of toxins, and you have to remember these toxins, okay? So you are going to circle, star, highlight toxins, okay? So the two categories of toxins, again, putting stars all over this slide and the next slide, the two big categories of toxins are exotoxins and endotoxins. So when you hear the word exo, exo, like exoskeleton, that tells you it's on the outside. It's released. So exotoxins are secreted to the outside of the cell, of the bacterial cell. The fact that it's secreted and it's from living bacteria, this is very problematic to us and it makes them the most lethal of toxins. Okay, so circle, circle the fact that these are the most lethal and put a little star next to living bacteria secreting. Okay, the reason these are most lethal is because think about it. These toxins can act remotely without the pathogen. And if you kill the bacteria, that's not gonna be enough to heal the patient you still have these toxins floating around through their body. Now, what is most lethal about them, though, is the fact that these are toxins being secreted by living bacteria. They are still alive, which means they can continuously pump more and more and more toxin throughout your body. That's more lethal and damaging to you because it's a factory, basically, consistently pumping this toxin throughout your body. You'll see in a minute why this or how this varies from endotoxins, which are not as toxic. Now, the big examples of exotoxins that you tend to encounter are cytotoxins, neurotoxins, and enterotoxins. Whenever you hear the term cyto in biology, cyto means cells. So cytotoxins will kill any cell that it comes in contact with. A big example of this is anthrax. So if you heard all those times there were anthrax scares, that's because the anthrax toxin will be cytotoxic and it will cause major hemorrhages and pulmonary edema as it's destroying cell after cell. 
Neurotoxins, another example of exotoxins, are also very lethal because these guys interfere with your neurological sing signals. So a big example of this that I want you to remember is botulinum toxin, so the toxin from botulism, and remember tetanus. So botulism and tetanus will produce neurotoxins. Since they're targeting the neurological signals in your body, that means that they'll block things like acetylcholine and cause paralysis. Now you may ask yourself, well, how is paralysis lethal? Well, it's not just muscles, regular old moving your arms and legs that becomes paralyzed. What other muscles can become paralyzed? Cardiac and respiratory. So you lose the ability to pump blood or to breathe, so the patient dies. So neurotoxins are usually rather fast acting and dangerous. The last one on the list here for exotoxins are enterotoxins. And whenever you see the word entero or enteric, remember GI, GI tract. So enterotoxins will affect the lining of the digestive system and cause things like diarrhea and vomiting which can be dangerous in terms of dehydration. Now, the alternative is some bacteria instead will produce endotoxins. And when you hear endo, endo means within. So endotoxins are within the bacteria's own cell wall. They're in the outer layers of gram-negative cells usually. So for instance, the lipids that we mentioned in earlier slides. The difference with endotoxins, since they're built into the bacteria cell wall, endotoxins are only released when the cell dies. This means that they're not as toxic as exotoxins, because think of it, what's more dangerous? If you have a serial killer, or if you have someone who commits suicide when they commit the murder? Well, the suicide killer, they only can kill that wh whoever they killed at that moment. They can't kill anymore once they're dead. Whereas a serial killer, which is the exotoxins, they're still alive. They can keep killing, keep killing, keep killing, keep releasing toxins. So endotoxins are not as toxic because they're basically suicide death. Okay, so endotoxins are less toxic and released only when they die. And the other thing that they're most known for is causing fever, okay, fever. Now, one last bullet point that I mentioned here is that endotoxins are more heat stable. And that makes sense since we just said that they target fever, so it makes sense that they're able to withstand the heat. It's basically because these are lipopolysaccharides usually, whereas exotoxins are soluble proteins that can end up denaturing. Now, in addition to toxins, another thing that bacteria can produce, well, some bacteria can produce, are endospores. And what this means is that during harsh conditions, meaning when the environment around the bacteria is not good, not safe for that bacteria, it can undergo sporulation, which is demonstrated in this figure here, where the bacteria will basically get rid of all the extra junk and put itself in this extra highly resistant little spore. Okay, and it confers a state of what we call dormancy, meaning it's not active, it's not replicating, you don't even realize it's there, it's just hiding until the environment around it becomes more habitable, okay, more favorable. So for instance, if there was UV or a very acidic environment around it, or even boiling, like it's in boiling water, um, it will go into this endospore until that goes away, until the UV is gone, until the temperature cools down. And at that point, it undergoes what's called germination.
okay? So sporulation is when it goes into that very resistant endospore form. Germination is then when conditions become more favorable, this spore will crack and take in water and go back to the, what we call vegetative active proper form of the bacteria. Now, why is this ability to form endospores beneficial to bacteria, but a problem for us? Well, that's because endospores are highly resistant. I want you to write that down. Endospores are highly resistant. They can resist boiling, high or low uh, pH. They can resist UV. A lot of them can, you know, resist the most unfavorable of conditions. And so it protects the bacteria, but it makes it more dangerous to, for us because it's harder for us to get rid of them. Examples of bacteria can produce, that can produce endospores and protect themselves and are highly resistant are the bacteria that cause things like botulism, tetanus, gangrene, and anthrax. And with botulism, that's why you can get botulism from canned food products, because even though the canning process is very intense, like high pressure, crazy high temperatures, you know, to really kill anything in there, endospores can survive it. And so that's why botulism or uh, botulinum toxins end up being able to survive that condition and, and be in those canned food products. Some other things that make bacteria more problematic for us is their ability to do what's called quorum sensing and to form biofilms. So the first one, quorum sensing, is basically that a lot of bacteria won't actually activate certain genes and won't produce certain proteins until they sense a large, so senses and detect a large population of fellow bacteria around them, okay? And the reason that is, is they wanna save resources. Why are they gonna use their energy, their, their resources to make, you know, let's say certain toxins or proteins if they're all by themselves and that product will have no effect on the host? Whereas if there's a whole lot of bacteria around them, they know that, you know, their energy will, will be utilized for good. You know, they, they, the toxin or the protein that they produce will now have an effect and get something done because they're surrounded by a whole bunch of their buddies doing the same thing. And so they can really take down that host and get something accomplished. Biofilms are another thing that bacteria can do, and I want you to circle star highlight the term biofilms and circle star highlight the example that plaque on your teeth is an example of biofilms. What biofilms are is when a whole bunch of different species of bacteria gather together and they clump together into this big aggregate of all different species kind of making a single population up on that, you know, on that surface as if they're one organism now rather than a whole bunch of separate bacteria. Now, this clump of bacteria, for instance, on your teeth is very problematic to us as humans because by by them getting together with a bunch of different species, it becomes a lot harder for us to treat or to get rid of biofilms. Because what you may do, let's say a certain disinfectant, antiseptic, you know, what you may use against them might work for one, maybe two species, but it's not gonna get rid of all of them. So it makes them more powerful and more resistant being in biofilms. And not only do you find this on your teeth, but you also find it on a lot of metals like medical equipment, so surgical equipment. You find it uh, in the inside of things like water pipes throughout the house, throughout you know, the, the, the outside world. So biofilms can, can gather on a lot of different things and they're highly resistant. But the example I want you to really remember is that plaque on your teeth is an example of biofilms. Now that we talked about a lot of the scary part of, of 
you know, microbes and, and how bacteria can cause big problems for us. I want to end this lecture with a few slides on how we can treat them with regard to antibiotics. Now we go into the details of the exact mechanism in upper level courses, but for now I want you to know that antibiotics are a way to treat bacteria. And what's interesting is that they're actually naturally produced by bacteria and fungi. So antibiotics are not something that we just synthesize from scratch in a lab. We actually first isolated them from fungal contaminations of, of bacterial samples. So for instance, you can see here that wherever you have something that's producing an antibiotic, you see this empty zone, this clear halo around a colony because it killed off all of the beige bacteria around it, okay? But now any bacteria that wants to produce antibiotics has to have a way to protect itself. So uh, basically think of it like this, if you're a bacteria and you're producing antibiotics, which are a substance that kills bacteria, you do not want to get yourself killed. So they have various ways such as basically not having an active form of that antibiotic produce. Instead, it will produce and get rid of it into the environment. And then in that process, the antibiotic then becomes active and can kill whatever's around it. Or the bacteria will have the natural resistance to that particular antibiotic. So in its genetic sequence, for instance, in a plasmid, which is extra DNA that bacteria have, it might have a gene that allows it to be resistant to that antibiotic. Now, when we talk about antibiotics, I want you to know these four terms that you see here, and you've probably encountered them in your everyday life as well, since you know almost everybody has either had a loved one or themselves have to take antibiotics at one point or another. Now, when you hear the term broad spectrum versus narrow spectrum antibiotics, broad spectrum will kill many different bacteria. So for instance, picturing an antibiotic capable of killing both gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Okay, so write down that broad spectrum will kill or, or target many different kinds of bacteria, for instance, gram positive and gram negative, whereas narrow spectrum will only target one or very few particular bacteria. So for instance, for narrow spectrum, picture it only targeting gram positive and not being able to attack gram negative, okay? Then you have bacteriocidal versus static. And whenever you see cidal, such as homicidal, suicidal, genocidal, that means killing. And so in this case, it's killing bacteria. So bacteriocidal substances will kill the bacteria or the microbe, whereas bacteriostatic, static, tells you that instead the substance will slow or stop the growth of that bacteria. But what won't it do? It will not kill it, okay? So circle star highlight the fact that bacteriostatic things do not kill the bacteria, it only slows it down. And in addition to talking about these terms with antibiotics, I want you to write down that temperatures, for instance, have uh, have these terms associated with them. So very high temperatures are bactericidal. That's why cooking food kills the microbes, whereas bacteriostatic is cold temperatures. So when you put food in a refrigerator or a freezer, you're not killing the bacteria. Instead, you're slowing down the growth. And that's why you can't keep food in a fridge for an indefinite amount of time. You know, within a few days, you will start to smell and see the microbial growth that's occurred because it's still alive, it's still growing, but just very, very slow, okay? So keep these terms in mind. I can describe, I could say, you know, an antibiotic kills a bacteria, which of these terms would apply? An antibiotic targets both gram-positive and gram-negative, which would 
would best you know apply to it okay if you have any questions let me know in the remind app now when we talk about things being you know targeted for bacteria a term we need to know for medical uh, use of antibiotics is selective toxicity in the medical field you want to pick an antibiotic that is the most selectively toxic. You do not want the least selectively toxic. And what that means is selective toxicity means that the antibiotic will kill the microbe without harming the host, okay? meaning without harming the human being. You want it to select for bacteria and not be able to hurt humans, okay? So selective toxicity means toxic to a selective group, specifically the bacteria, not the human. The most selectively toxic target I want you to write down is the cell wall, okay? Because bacteria have a cell wall, but you know who doesn't? Human cells. So if you take an antibiotic that's targeting a cell wall, it will cause the least problem in your body because it will target the bacteria that has cell walls and, you know, kill them by, by breaking down or stopping them from having a cell wall, whereas it will not be able to hurt our cells as much because we don't have a cell wall that it's targeting. So that's most selectively toxic target is the cell wall. The least selectively toxic target I want you to write down is the plasma membrane okay the plasma membrane because all cells you know whether it's a, a bacteria or a human cell have a plasma membrane and the composition is very similar between the two between bacteria and humans so if you take an antibiotic that's targeting plasma membranes that's trying to destroy plasma membranes to kill the bacteria it will also hurt your human cells because you have a very similar plasma membrane okay please make sure you know selective toxicity means hurting the bacteria not the ho human host you want the most, you want your antibiotic or your whatever you're using, whether it's disinfected antiseptics also, you want them to target bacteria cell walls if possible, because that's the most selectively toxic target that won't hurt human cells. Least selectively toxic that will hurt you is the plasma membrane if the drug or the substance is targeting plasma membranes. Now, unfortunately, as great as antibiotics are, we are now in what's called an antibiotic resistance crisis. More and more people are showing very strong resistance to antibiotics, so a lot of antibiotics are not working as well as they used to. So, for instance, the first antibiotic discovered and used was penicillin. Nowadays, penicillin does not work as well because we have, you know, used it so much that a lot of the bacteria that is around now is resistant to it, meaning they won't get killed by it, okay? There are various actions that have led to antibiotic resistance being so big now. One of them, well, the big one, is the clinical misuse of antibiotics, meaning that when doctors or, or medical professionals give out antibiotics like their candy basically and and it's not their fault it's what the system has become and it's also the patients who pressure them a lot of people will want to take antibiotics for everything not realizing that antibiotics are specifically targeting bacterial structures for instance they will not work for a virus virus does not have a cell wall it does not have the same uh, anatomy that a bacteria has. So if you take an antibiotic without, you know, getting cultured, without being being sure of what you have, that it's a bacterial infection, if you take uh, 
an antibiotic for something like a cold or the flu that's a virus, what that antibiotic is then doing is it's killing the good normal flora bacteria in your body that help protect you. And that means that it is now allowing any of the resistant bad guys in your body to have more space, more nutrients, reproduce, and become a bigger population. And what do you know about bacteria when they're in a big population? That's when they cause problems for you. Remember we mentioned quorum sensing, okay? So taking antibiotics for things like a virus is one of the actions that's a problem. Taking antibiotics that have not been prescribed to you is a big problem. And keeping, you know, not finishing your course of antibiotics. If they give you two weeks worth of pills, even if you start feeling a little bit better after day five, let's say, you never, ever, ever stop before you finish the full course. Because whenever you're doing any of these types of things, again, what you end up doing that leads to robust resistant populations is that you kill off your normal flora, which are the good bacteria that are in your body, on your skin, that take up the resources and, and the space to protect you, to prevent pathogens from taking over. So if you take a lot of antibiotics, especially when you're not supposed to, when you don't need them, you're killing the good bacteria and allowing the bad guys, the resistant bad guys, to reproduce and take over, okay? So that's what has caused resistant populations. And it's important to understand that concept because a lot of people are under the misinformation, you know, the, the wrong idea. A lot of people think, oh, you know, antibiotic resistance is when I take an antibiotic, it mutates my bacteria and, you know, it, it makes them, them powerful and resistant. No, 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 no. The antibiotic is not doing anything to that resistant bacteria. It's not mutating it. It's not creating the resistance in that individual bacteria. What happens is some bacteria already are resistant. Remember when we talk about genetics and, and gene transfer and the idea of plasmids and, and gene sequences, some bacteria already have genes that are resistant to particular antibiotics, okay? It's a natural thing. Some came about maybe long, long ago from mutations, but not by being, by encountering, you know, our pills of antibiotics. Our pills of antibiotics do not cause mutations. They're not causing the bacteria itself, the individual bacteria to become resistant. What is creating the resistance is that the pill that you're taking is then killing off the normal flora good guys and allowing now for there to be space and resources for the resistant bad guys. You are selecting for, you know, evolutionary selection, like when we talk about natural selection, you're making the conditions ideal for the bad guys to reproduce and take over, okay? Because they're the only ones that can naturally survive that particular antibiotic. So please, circle star, highlight the fact that when you take an antibiotic, you are not mutating anything to create resistance. You are killing off normal flora and making conditions good for the bad guys. So now I'm going to show you drawing to kind of help visualize this. And I wrote down the main take home message that you're going to see in this drawing and that I've already mentioned on the previous slide as well. Make sure to pause at some point and draw this diagram in your notes so that you have the take home message of antibiotic resistance, which is that in your body normally, you'll have a whole bunch of normal flora, which we represent here in blue. And scattered throughout, there'll be some resistant potential pathogens, but right now they can't do much because the normal flora is all over the place, taking up space, taking up resources, 
Now, what happens when you then pump antibiotics into that patient? Well, the normal flora that was not resistant to that antibiotic have now been killed off and only the resistant potential pathogens survive. Now, what do you notice they can do? Boom, they now have all the space and resources to replicate, replicate, replicate. And now they flourish and they pass on to each of these offspring that resistance, right? Because that's how bacteria replicate. They're dividing themselves. So the offspring will be identical to them. Okay, so now they have the chance to reproduce and pass on that resistance. Okay, so again, keep in mind when you hear overuse of antibiotics or misuse, think of the fact that it's killing off normal flora. So the resistant pathogens now have a chance to flourish and pass on their resistance, okay? Notice there was no mutations occurring here, no, you know, strengthening of the bacteria themselves. They were already strong. They were already resistant. We just gave them the ideal environment to pass on that resistance and to flourish. Okay, that is it for today's lecture. As I mentioned in the very beginning, the field that we study all of this stuff in is called microbiology. Many of you will take that later on, and it's one of my favorite courses to teach because there's a lot of, you know, really, really interesting things that are applicable to your everyday life in that course. And this lecture was just a very small sampling of some of the cool concepts that you will encounter there. And in that class, we get to go into the more gory pictures and details of all of the infections that you hear of every day uh, and that you may encounter every day without realizing that you, you know, you're coming so close to these scary bacteria. All right. As always, if you have any questions, any concerns, contact me in the Remind app day or night. Like I always say, I have no life, so I am more than happy to reply to you. Thank you and have a great day.